at only 21 degrees. Jakarta to the north will shine at 30. Stay tuned to France 24. Welcome back to this edition of The Debate on France 24. I'm Andrea Sanke in Paris, and tonight we've been discussing the state of the global markets. How much is at risk, given the current volatility? And joining me again to debate the issues involved, Liz Alderman, business editor at the International Herald Tribune, Christopher Mesnu, international corporate attorney, Max Kaiser, markets and finance analyst and founder of KarmaBank.com, and via satellite from New York, Pierre Alexander, France 24's Wall Street Correspondent. Thanks all so much for joining us again. Pierre, let's just uh, first find out where things stand in New York today. Any trauma on the markets or are things there in relatively good shape right now? Not no uh, drama, no uh, panic. We have a Dow Jones we, uh, is up now, uh, 15 points, with uh, a market very, very active. We have already 1 billion 400 million stock exchange, which is a level we uh, saw usually at the closing bell, and it's very impressive for uh, August 1st. And this market is very reactive to all the news from the housing market. We get a good number this morning about uh, pending home sales up 5% and the Dow Jones was up immediately and after we have a rumor about uh, bankruptcy about uh, uh, construction group Beezer Home and immediately uh, the, the market uh, was in the red. Okay, so interesting good news apparently out of the housing market, uh, pending sales up 5%. Does that give you any confidence Liz? Because let's, let's look at the statistics. American Home Mortgage Investment Corporation is now looking at liquidating its assets and said it can no longer borrow based on its own credit facilities. Is the market, the housing market, in safe shape right now, or is it overinflated? And we're going to watch the subprime lending issues really come to a head. Well, that 5% figure that was just mentioned doesn't give me a huge amount of confidence because statistics can change rather radically on a monthly basis. And the trend that we're seeing is, generally speaking, one in which uh, housing prices on the American market have actually started to come down um, in, a, in a rather dramatic fashion um, over the last six months to a year. Um, that combined with the fact that many, many people uh, in the United States have taken out these subprime mortgages, which is basically a loan to people who are otherwise not considered extremely creditworthy. Mm. They took these loans out um, at a very low interest rate because the lender entices them with a low interest rate. Uh, and then what happens is that after a couple of years, uh, those mortgages then get repriced at a higher interest rate. Many of those loans were taken out in 2005, 2006, and that higher interest rate is going to kick in toward the end of this year. Mm -hmm. So the volatility that we're seeing today, even if uh, it winds up being a little bit temporary like the spurt that we saw back in February, is quite likely to come back and, and haunt us um, toward the end of the year if we find that more, home, more of these home buyers are not able to afford uh, the purchases. I think it's something like 3.5 million people took out these subprime loans a little while back. About half of those people are expected to default, possibly toward the end of Do the year. Do you personally really worry about, let's call it the end game for the subprime lending market at this point? I think it is a, a source of concern um, uh, for economists worldwide, for central banks worldwide, uh, and for anybody who's invested, mm -hmm. you know, in markets, um, because we have seen, you know, a, a housing bubble form in the United States less than 10 years after we saw a technology bubble form in the United States. And it's rather amazing that people don't seem to have learned their lesson from the bursting of the technology bubble. Mm. Everybody jumped in to make a quick buck, and now we're seeing the fruits of that come back to haunt us. Okay. Christopher? I think it's hard to talk about one single housing market in any country. If you look, generally speaking, you're very correct. If you look at the markets in the United States, you have a place like Manhattan where prices are continuing to go up. Mm. You have Miami, where the condo market has clearly been overbuilt, and people are trying to get out, even leaving their deposits with the builders and developers, and simply not closing on their condo purchases, because they don't believe going forward they're going to be able to recoup their investment in any reasonable amount of time. Mm -hmm. So if you break the market down, you've got places where it's probably going to stay fairly healthy, and then you have a lot of places where housing has clearly been overdone, overpriced, and people are going to run out the door as quickly as they can. And I don't think, I think it's convenient to say this is all subprime, 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 but if you look at the condo market in Miami, which is one place I'm fairly familiar with, 
that is not a subprime market. But you, so you seem to be noting a lot of stabilizing factors, in a sense. These statistics, as Liz said, these statistics change from month to month. You can find other grimmer statistics about how prices are down over the last six months, mm -hmm. down over the last 12 months. This little uptick in pending sales of plus 5 percent, that's from a year ago, but things were already down a year ago compared to the year before. So the fact that things went down a lot and are now coming up a little bit doesn't mean that it's really a healthy market. It just means there's been a momentary uptick. Okay. Max? Well, you've had uh, housing uh, collapses before regionally. In uh, Texas in the 1980s, you had the see-through city, Houston. There was a huge uh, housing crash. Uh, but this is a coast-to-coast -coast housing uh, debacle caused by over-leverage. Uh, the leverage, if you go back to these investment banks, you're talking about leverage of 50, 50 to 1. That means for every 2% decline in the value of that house, the value of the collateral goes to zero. So it doesn't take much of a move down to start a chain reaction of the debts that are being stacked up mm. on these, uh, these portfolios of derivative products to start to implode. And then you've got, of course, the reset for interest rates coming later this year. And uh, the, there is no income coming in to service those debts, and there's nobody really to suck up the market and buy these properties at any price because they've also got problems with the car loan market. has been collateralized and securitized in the same way. Everything in America has become collateralized and securitized, the art market, the wine market. Everything almost that you can put a number to has become collateral, collateralized, securitized, and over-leveraged. Now this big leverage bubble is popping because rates are rising. Because why? Because for the last 10 years, labor has taken this very interesting route through China and given us cheap labor. Well, guess what? There's no more cheap labor in China anymore. Labor in China is moving up in price. Therefore, prices all over the world are moving up. Interest rates moving up. Inflation moving up. Interest rates moving up. That means all these derivative products that are stacked up like pancakes on top of each other, mm. they have to be marked to market in a way that demonstrates that there's, as Moody said, Mm. We're going to reprice this paper, and it's going to be marked down anywhere between 10 and 100 percent. Now, I've been on Wall Street following markets for 25 years. I've never heard a statement of a, ra of a, ra of a, a rating agency uh -huh. indicate that they were wrong by 100 percent. Usually they say, or oh, it's on credit watch negative. It's going from double B to double B plus or double B minus. It's very finely gra gra gradated to say they're off by 100 percent. That's like, uh, that's like saying we're uh, jumping off a very tall building. But can